Um, this recording or this presentation is being recorded, um, so you will be able to watch it later on our YouTube channel. Um, so I'd just like to thank you all for joining us today um, for the Grand Traverse Conservation District's Native Plant Workshop. Um, we're really excited to have you here. We think you're in for a great evening of uh, learning and adventure and fun. Um, and my name is Katie Grishak. I'm the Invasive Species Network Coordinator, but I also uh, do a bit of work on uh, the seedling and native plant sales, which is uh, kind of separate from the rest of my job. Um, so I'm just going to give a, a quick overview about the Grand Traverse Conservation District for you today. Um, and then I'm going to pass it off to Garrett Noyce from the Bird's Foot Native Nursery um, to teach us all about native plants today. So thank you for joining us. Um, a little bit of uh, kind of housekeeping. Uh, please keep yourself muted just so that we can have everybody um, have the best sound possible. Um, it may make sense to turn off your video so that you aren't um, sending video. That's up to you. Um, you know, we love seeing your faces, but if you're having trouble with um, internet connectivity, um, there's, we don't have to see you. So um, you can definitely do that to help things go more smoothly. Um, if you have a question at any time, please feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, I will be monitoring that and passing those questions on to Garrett sometimes during, but mostly at the end of the presentation, we'll have lots of time for questions. So we'd love to have them. Please feel free to drop those in the chat. Um, and with that, I think I will get into um, our presentation here. So uh, a little bit about the Grand Traverse Conservation District. Um, we were established in 1941. So this is actually our 80th year. We're very excited. Um, and this was in response to the Dust Bowl. Um, lots of people and especially farmers um, were finding that they needed help on knowing what the most up-to-date stuff was. You know, they didn't have time to do all the research themselves. So conservation districts were created to help. It started with farmers, but soon everyone with conservation questions. Um, we just serve the Grand Traverse County, um, but also have several programs as we'll talk about that serve a larger area in Northwest Michigan. Um, we don't receive any federal funds or state funds other than grants that we apply for. Um, but in 2018, we were awarded by the Grand Traverse County voters a millage um, that goes a really long way to helping that base support of our operations so that we're here to answer your questions and, and be here to support you. So today, um, we support a, a lot of conservation goals in our region um, from agriculture and education, um, helping people connect with the outside world with their natural areas um, and doing restoration work as well. Um, as far as our nature education, we are located here at the beautiful Boardman River Nature Center. Um, may not look that beautiful behind me, this is the office portion, but we do have a really glorious nature center, um, which are unfortunately closed right now to keep everyone safe with COVID. Um, but we have some really fantastic outdoor attractions from gardens that use all native plants. So if you have some questions about what does this look like, you can stop by our gardens um, any day of the year to see how that is. Um, and also just great educational opportunities outside. Um, we have a lot of programming for youth and for the public, everything from genuinely like tiny little newborn babies getting those very, very first, you know, like put their hands in the dirt, make them touch the grass, um, all the way up through adults and family programming, um, just really helping to connect folks with our natural world. And, and one of the biggest things that I would share is that if you ever have a conservation question, please come to us. That's what we're here for is to help find those answers. Maybe we know the answers in house. Maybe we can send you to the experts who would know, or maybe we can help you find the answer. We're here to support you. We're here to, to serve. Um, we also do a lot with the Boardman River as the Boardman River Nature Center uh, name might suggest. Um, we work in uh, Two county or yeah, two counties to restore the Bourbon River and its watershed, um, working to clear the river for safe passage and to um, improve the habitat in the river for our fish and our humans who use it. Um, we manage uh, plenty of parklands in Grand Traverse County, um, including trails and natural areas um, that you can. Uh, access. And these are really fantastic ways to get out and enjoy nature, uh, especially in a time where mental health and physical health are so important. These are really fantastic ways, some of the real gems of our county. So we invite you to partake in these and um, 
give a little shout out to us when you when you find a good trail. And if you find a trail that uh, maybe has something wrong, maybe there's a tree over the trail, please contact us. Um, it's really helpful for us to know where that is, uh, and we can we can help fix that. Um, we also still work in agriculture. Um, the MEEP program or Michigan Agriculture Environmental Assurance Program works directly with growers um, to help make sure that they are uh, following all of the best practices uh, to make their agriculture sustainable and, and environmentally friendly. Um, and it's a free program and it's confidential. So if, if you are a grower and you're, oh gosh, I'm just not really sure, this is a great way to learn in a way um, that can connect you with the right resources. It's, it's a very uh, celebratory um, program. And then you can look for this um, a verification sign for those farms that have already gone through it. So definitely take a look if you're not a farmer um, and you're visiting our wineries, for example, many of those um, wineries are verified and it's really, really great. And, and tons of other fantastic growers throughout our region, not just the wineries. Um, we also work directly with forest landowners. Um, and, you know, we think about gajillions of acres, but there's no property too small. Uh, Camera Ross is a really fantastic forestry assistance program forester who can come out, um, help you make decisions about the management of your property based on what goals you have, um, which is such a cool thing. And then again, connect you with those resources for forest land management. Um, the Northwest, I say my favorite for last, of course, is the Northwest Michigan Invasive Species Network. So this is the group that I work with. Um, we work in four counties, Benzie, Grand Traverse, Leelanau, and Manistee. Um, and we do everything from on the ground work and control all the way up to prevention and education and, and restoration. Um, you know, after invasive species have been removed, how do we, um, you know, invite that, that uh, well-functioning habitat back in? Um, and one really cool program we have, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Shelly Stusick, our Go Beyond Beauty specialist. Hi there. Like Katie said, I'm Shelly Stusick, and I'm the Go Beyond Beauty specialist with the Northwest Michigan Invasive Species Network, or ISN. So a significant percentage of the invasive species of concern for our region came from intentionally introducing them as garden ornamentals. So that's not necessarily uh, new news, but um, Go Beyond Beauty, the Go Beyond Beauty program was created to mitigate this by lifting up those who are going above and beyond in their businesses and in their yards. So Go Beyond Beauty promotes and provides support to garden professionals and concerned citizen groups and individuals who are committed to not sell or use high priority ornamental invasive plants and to educate the public to change demand. So we do this by provi through providing educational resources, events, signs, stickers, and most importantly, exclusive referrals and promotion of the professionals through active and online outreach. So we also like to say that Go Beyond Beauty is a non-regulatory but celebratory program. And in ISN service area, we have over 50 participants. Uh, so while the original intent of this program was geared exclusively towards garden professionals, when community members and organizations also wanted to make the same commitment, we said, of course. Um, so our participants are comprised of an array of professions and interests. We have our garden professional participants who are nurseries like Bird's Foot, who we're gonna hear from today. And you know, we have garden centers, landscapers, landscape architects or designers, um, all in that category kind of. And then we have our community participants which are widely diverse. They include community organizations, homeowners and landowners, really anyone with a garden who wants to disuse invasive ornamentals in their landscapes and in their profession. So what I personally love most about it is that everyone who participates is genuinely excited about it, uh, including Garrett, you know, it's a, a simple, free, and completely voluntary program at the base level. We do work to recognize participants who go above this base level, and we have achievement levels to provide invasive species training and education, including site visits and even native plant replacement recommendations. So we have kind of, and that's for both community and professional um, uh, garden professionals. And so the big news and the reason why I'm here is that later this year, the pro this program will include others around the state. 
So that's the reason I was brought on and we're really excited to go statewide. So if you'd like to know more about uh, the program itself, or if you wanna check out our participants, um, please check out our page on ISN's website, habitatmatters.org slash go beyond beauty. And don't uh, hesitate to contact me directly. It's literally what I'm here for. So my information is up here, but I'll also put these details in the chat as well, if no one minds. And I should be sticking around for the Q&A section as well, if you have any questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Shelley. So yeah, Go Beyond Beauty is amazing. Uh, and uh, it is, you know, focused on invasives, but today we get to focus on natives, which is very cool. Um, and just to wrap up, you know, if you'd like to get involved with the Grand Traverse Conservation District, there are chances to volunteer with us. You know, you can always just promote responsible engagement with the outdoors that absolutely fits in with our mission. Um, visiting us here uh, and, you know, just coming to programs, joining us for webinars, and of course, donations are always deeply appreciated. Um, so with that, that's enough. That's enough of that. Um, and so I'm going to stop my screen sharing and invite Garrett to share his screen so that we can get on to uh, the main event here with native plants. Just a moment here. Let's see. All right. Does that look right to everybody? It's perfect. Okay, great. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us tonight. I uh, hope you all are enjoying this early spring. Feels like we're almost a month ahead of where we normally are, which uh, we're trying to grow uh, plants and get them to folks early is is a good thing. Um, so hopefully it it doesn't slip back into winter before before we're all the way through spring. Um, so my name is Garrett Noyce. Uh, my wife and I um, own and operate Bird's Foot Native Nursery. We're out in South Boardman, uh, about a half hour east of uh, Traverse City. And we've been uh, growing there since uh, 2018. We had started out uh, by working with uh, Vern Stevens of Designs by Nature. Um, and we still work really closely with him. Uh, he had been supplying the Conservation District plant sales up in this area uh, for years. Um, so he got us set up with um, some seed sources and, and some of the, some of the know-how. Um, and we follow in its footsteps by providing plants to conservation district plant sales like Grand Traverse here. Uh, we also wholesale to uh, landscapers, uh, designers, and some retail nurseries and uh, conservation organizations for restoration projects, um, things like that. And we do some direct sales to, to customers as well. Um, still growing, still trying to add more species every year. Um, it's, a, it's a long process generally. Um, but uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. So I'm um, gonna get started um, here with this map. Um, this is a pre-settlement um, vegetation map of the state of Michigan. And it's a little hard to, to see all the detail on your screen there, but the idea you get from it first off is that we have a really wide variety of habitat types here in, in lower Michigan. Um, you know, for one thing, we're, we're sort of on that vegetative tension zone, as it's called, where you start to transition from a more um, southern or central type forest into more of a northern forest. So you can really see where the colors change um, kind of in a line that goes from Saginaw Bay um, kind of trending sort of southwest towards Ludington. Um, and that's where you really start to see a shift in, in some of our um, ecosystem types. And it's a little hard to see, but there's a band along the south there where a lot of our, um, in the southwest corner of the state and kind of trending towards the, the east. Um, and that's where some of our traditional uh, prairie and savanna type habitats uh, were pre-settlement. In the northern part of the state up here, um, a lot of our, what our local version of that would have been typically um, were jack pine barrens, oak barrens, and savannas. Um, and in both of these instances, north and, and south, these, these um, areas were often maintained and um, kept the way they were by uh, pretty frequent wildfires. Um, and that's something that obviously we've suppressed a lot, um, you know, since uh, folks have settled Michigan. And a lot of this, the southern part of the state, those prairie and savanna areas, because it was good soil, um, you know, were sort of the first to get developed into farmland. So, 
on both fronts, you have um, a lot of habitat loss in, um, in those types of areas. And that's just one example of where a lot of our, you know, native plant diversity uh, was pre-settlement. Um, obviously, there's many other habitat types that are very diverse as well uh, from woodlands and, and wetlands uh, that are found throughout the state. So kind of what is a native plant? Um, you know, it's a native plant species that evolved uh, here, um, you know, wherever here is, but evolved evolved um, for the ecosystem, uh, for the, the climate conditions, soil conditions, um, and the local wildlife populations where it's found. Um, so there's a lot of terminologies that are out there in the nursery trade, uh, you know, wildflowers is, is sort of a broad term you'll hear applied sometimes and something can be called a wildflower in the nursery trade and not necessarily be a native plant. Um, and then native plants can be bred um, to have other traits, which I'll talk about a little bit more too. Um, and then, you know, they're not, not truly a native plant at that point. So, um, Native plants are important uh, for a number of reasons, and um, it's before I jump right into this food web stuff, I'll uh, just, um, in addition to these ecosystem services that they provide, like food, um, you know, they have a lot of other um, important services that they provide to the ecosystem, like uh, erosion control and uh, carbon sequestration and these types of things are, are really important. And we'll, we'll dive into some of those a little bit more too as we go. But um, native plant species are the foundation of, of healthy ecosystems. Um, they're food for numerous, um, you know, basically all insect species feed on either vegetation or insects that feed on vegetation. So bees, beetles, flies, butterflies, skippers, moths, um, all of these insects feed in one form or another on native plant vegetation. And then they're in turn food for other insects uh, that are predatory. And then, um, you know, birds, fish, reptiles, and amphibians. Some of you may have seen this figure before, but um, uh, one family of chickadees uh, eat approximately six to 9,000 caterpillars on the time it takes from hatching to fledging. Uh, that's a lot of, a lot of insects. Um, in addition to that, berries, seeds, nuts um, on plants um, like that, that uh, silky dogwood um, up in the photo there um, provide high energy food source for a lot of bird species, in particular, uh, you know, in the fall, uh, you know, as they're, as they're migrating or, or trying to store energy before winter. And um, the importance of, of this of these native plants, uh, you know, really can't be understated to the health of the whole ecosystem. Um, you know, if you you start to pull these, they're just one smoking gun that you can can kind of point to for some of the the problems that we're seeing across native insect populations and native bird populations. Uh, one 2019 study indicates that 40% of insect species worldwide are in decline. Uh, that's eight times faster extinction rate than mammals, reptiles, or birds. I think it's a 2.5% a annual decline um, is estimated. And, and if that continues, um, that would literally mean no insects on earth within a century. Um, hopefully that doesn't become true, but um, no matter how you look at it, um, you know, the, the populations are really down. And, um, you know, there's, there's a number of factors that could be causing that. Um, you know, change in agricultural practices, much more widespread use of pesticides and herbicides, uh, development, and then, uh, you know, loss of native plant populations through development, agriculture, and the introduction and spread of, of non-native invasive species. Uh, songbirds being a little further up the food chain are, are also uh, suffering uh, really large declines with estimated 30% decline since 1970. This is all, all kind of doom and gloom, but the uh, important thing is that, you know, we can all do something about it um, really pretty easily in our, at least in our corner of the world. Before I jump to how we can, some of the things we can do about that, one of these other smoking guns, um, and that's something as a, as a consumer and somebody who wants to, uh, you know, garden with native plants uh, should be aware of is, is neonicotinoids. They're a neurotoxin pesticide. Um, they cause paralysis and death in, in most insect species. 
uh, also have some effect on uh, songbirds. And um, there's the science isn't quite as certain on that, but it looks like it might suppress their, um, you know, their appetite um, as, as well as other effects. But once it's treated, um, every part of that plant remains toxic um, for uh, months and even years. So, you know, if it was treated as a seedling um, and then the plant continues to grow, um, as it creates a new plant tissue and blooms, all parts of that plant um, contain that that neonicotinoid um, toxin. So it's used in large scale production nurseries um, that then get distributed, um, you know, to other outlets. Um, you know, typically it's it's in the in the larger um, larger sales outlets that you that you might see this. Um, and luckily, there has been some increased awareness uh, in the past few years of the use of neonicotinoids. And I know, um, I don't know the details, but I know some of the, the larger um, box stores um, have pledged to not source uh, plants that have neonicotinoids or have been treated with neonicotinoids. So as a consumer and somebody uh, looking to purchase a plant, um, it's, it's something you really want to make sure um, that you're, you know, checking for. Um, and, uh, you know, make sure that the person you're purchasing from can, can, um, you know, verify that, that they're not sourcing plants that have been treated with, with neonicotinoids. And one of the reasons they're so sinister is the plant still functions, um, as a draw for insects. Um, so, you know, that New England aster in the photo there, um, you know, if that had been treated with neonicotinoids, the monarch is still going to come in and nectar on that plant and would then be poisoned. Uh, so it really functions as, as an ecological trap. Um, so obviously something we really want to avoid as much as possible or, well, absolutely altogether. And um, a little more about uh, pollinators and um, pollinators can be um, one of many uh, different insect species. Um, a lot of people think of, of honeybees. Um, honeybees, the Eurasian honeybee, are, are actually an, an introduced species and, and really they're, they're a form of, of livestock. You know, they're, they're tended by uh, people for, for agricultural purposes. Um, they do pollinate uh, native species, but um, there are actually over 450 species of native bees in Michigan. Um, everything from, from multiple uh, bumblebee species uh, down to uh, you know, minor bees and, and sweat bees and many other types of solitary bees. Um, not a lot of research is, is done on, on these bees and, and you know, the, the population declines that some of them might be suffering. Uh, they're just a little harder to study and, and there isn't quite as much um, funding and interest in that. Uh, but they do a tremendous amount of work in pollinating our native species. Um, the pollen uh, is a, an important uh, protein source um, for the for the bees. Um, so you know it it benefits the plant and it benefits uh, the bees. But um, in addition to bees, uh, you know beetles, um, flies, moths, uh, butterflies, skippers, uh, many other species do pollinate some not not quite as efficiently. They're not made for that purpose as much as as you know some some uh, bee species are. Uh, but the big thing there with with that 450 different species uh, to think about is is the diversity. You have a, a really large diversity of um, you know bee sizes and shapes, and their mouth parts are all built differently. Uh, you know some bees have really long tongues, um, so they they can feed on um, you know, deeper tubular type flowers um, that that require a long tongue bee to to get in there um, to get to get nectar, and um, other bees uh, like a you see that uh, in the upper right um, that's prairie smoke uh, when it's, it has a closed bloom in the spring, it's mostly pollinated by bumblebees. Uh, that's a bumblebee there. Um, they're strong enough to to pry that uh, bloom open a bit and and get in there at the pollen. Uh, so, you know, a variety of flower shapes as you're seeing there all work to attract uh, different different bees. Um, you know, they're all attracted to different colors, uh, different shapes. Um, so in the top left, uh, that's showy goldenrod. Uh, and there's some New England aster in there, uh, both great fall bloomers. And as you can see in the photo, they're, they're generally uh, crawling with, with bees um, in the fall, um, right up until, until freeze up. 
and uh, then that's Culver's Root um, down on the on the lower left. That's a summer um, blooming flower, and then a cutleaf cone flower over on the right with a with a fly on it, um, and that's a composite uh, flower there. Uh, where it has um, the ray flowers, which are the petals, and then the uh, disc flowers in the center. And you can see um, those move as, as the flower ripens, those disc flowers ripen up towards the center. And uh, sunflowers and asters and coreopsis and flowers of that type of shape um, is, are very attractive to a lot of pollinators. Um, they reflect the sun, they sort of move with the sun, and they sort of draw them into the center uh, where the pollen is. So. You know, one of the ways you can you can know that you're going to be um, getting the, the best variety of, of uh, benefit for these different species have as much diversity um, in shapes and sizes and then um, in your garden. And then in addition to that, um, trying to have blooms throughout the season. And um, the, the great part of that, too, is that's that's just kind of what we want, um, you know, as, as gardeners as well as we want to see uh, color and changing color and, and different shapes in our in our uh, garden throughout the season. So uh, you really want to make sure you're covering that early, uh, late, uh, mid season bloomers and uh, having some overlapping bloom time. And, uh, you know, one of the great things about Michigan native species is that there's such a huge variety to choose from. Um, you're really not limited at all by by sticking with natives. Um, you really can cover all of those bases and and then some. Uh, you're not going to have enough space or time for for them all. Grouping plants um, in clusters of three or more uh, does help to allow pollinators to forage uh, more efficiently. Yep. Yeah, I'm I'm on the third bullet point down. I'm just uh, rambling on uh, on this one, but thank you. Um, I think my speaker might be down a bit. Uh, and um, it also uh, is visually attractive, generally, you know, to have more than just uh, you know one or two isolated plants of a species, but but clustering them together, um, either in clusters of you know something like three or more, or even larger drifts. Uh, no pesticides, uh, of course. Um, uh, you know, using only seedlings that are free of nicotinoids, neonicotinoids, uh, avoiding cultivars and, and hybrids is going to give you the most benefit for native species. And uh, I mentioned cultivars earlier, and uh, you know, they're a human bred um, uh, plant. And the, the easiest way to identify those as a true uh, native plant is going to have, um, when you look at its botanical name or its scientific name, it's going to have you know, two names. It's going to have genus and then species. So, um, you know, butterfly milkweed is Asclepias tuberosa. And if it is a cultivar, it would be Asclepias tuberosa and then, um, you know, orange tangerine or something like that. It would have a, th a third sort of trade name. Um, and there's a lot of mixed science on, um, on whether cultivars provide the same ecosystem uh, benefits to native insects and birds as um, you know true natives and a lot of that depends on what was manipulated um, you know if it's the color um, you know it might not be as attractive uh, to the insect it might change the nectar um, but you know some things like leaf size might not be as big of a deal but uh, really it's it's uncertain and you know to to really be um, you know, giving it our best, um, you know, sticking with true natives is, is the way to go. And uh, providing a water source is, um, you know, can be important as well. Um, even a place uh, for, for puddling, um, you know, so a, a bird bath, or it could be even just a, a bird bath that's full of sand, but is kept, is kept damp. Uh, one good resource there down the lower left, the Xerces Society um, uh, has a, a pollinator plant list for the Great Lakes region that that gives you a pretty good place to start from um, and we'll show you some other resources at, at the end of this as well. Um, moving on to, to butterflies and skippers uh, again there's a, a lot of diversity here as well um, over 430 species of butterflies and, and moths in in Michigan alone. And like uh, many other pollinators, a lot of these uh, butterflies specialize on select um, 
plant species uh, for nectaring and um, another thing with butterflies is uh, larval host plants. And uh, that's where the butterfly species has adapted. Um, if it's a, one of these species that is specializing, uh, you know, they've adapted to um, their, their caterpillars can only feed on plants of a specific species or genus. Um, the monarch is, is one example that everyone is, is pretty familiar with um, nowadays. And, uh, you know, monarchs require um, milkweeds, uh, plants of the genus Asclepias, to, uh, for, their, for their caterpillars um, to feed on. And uh, then uh, nectar sources, again, as well, and, you know, different butterflies are, are drawn to different um, nectar sources throughout the season. And again, a diversity of species and bloom times is going to provide the most benefit there. And uh, they seem particularly drawn to, to flat-topped um, bloomers, things like Joe Pie, Boneset, um, that swamp milkweed in the right that that monarch is on there. Um, but really, we see um, butterflies and skippers on all kinds of, of plant species. Um, but again, that variety and, and bloom time throughout the season is, is what you really want to aim for in clustering species as, as well. So larval host plants that I mentioned earlier, here's the, the for monarchs, um, which are, are pretty well known uh, nowadays, um, and, and milkweeds. These are just three uh, milkweeds. We have, geez, six or so species in Michigan. I might be a little off there of, of milkweeds. Um, these are some of the more common, um, so common milkweed which uh, folks see around, uh, you know, in ditches and old fields quite a bit. It, it actually looks pretty nice in gardens too. It can be a little aggressive. Um, we don't plant it out much deliberately at our place because we have a lot that, that just kind of comes back every year. Um, uh, butterfly milkweed, um, the or one of the, our few orange blooms there. Um, and then swamp milkweed, uh, which is a great plant. Um, uh, in nature, it grows in, in wet areas, but it actually does pretty well in, in dry soils. Um, in addition to these, uh, you know, there's world milkweed, uh, tall green milkweed, clasping milkweed, purple Sullivan's. There's a lot of other uh, native milkweeds as well. They're a little less common um, and a little hard to get a hold of. But uh, I find at our place that common and swamp milkweed tend to be the most attractive to monarchs. Um, but they they will really uh, lay eggs and feed on all of the milkweeds. In fact, um, last year the monarchs were almost a little bit of a pest. Uh, it was kind of exasperating because we we grow a lot of our own seed, and um, we had just such an incredible hatch of caterpillars that they were eating just eating us out of house and home. They were eating the seed pods and and everything. Um, but luckily, we had some other other sources um, to get get some uh, butterfly milkweed seed from. But it's it's always great to see them around. Um, you know, we have flats of of milkweeds out in the in the summer, um, and you'll see adult monarchs um, going from from stem to stem to stem all over the flats, uh, laying eggs, and then and then a few weeks later they start erupting with caterpillars. So it's it's pretty neat. And uh, some other uh, larval host plants here um, that, that might not be as well known. Um, uh, Golden Alexanders, um, it's host plant of the black, black swallowtail butterfly, wild strawberry, grizzled skipper, which is um, a few of these are fairly rare, um, grizzled skipper and uh, some of the, the um, other skippers on here as well and, and found kind of more in, in Northern Michigan. I think the grizzle skipper is one of those. Uh, Pussy toes, American painted lady. Lupin uh, is a host to, I think, five um, species. Carner blue, uh, two species of dusky wings. Gray hair streak, uh, frosted elfin. Shrubby sink foil um, is a host plant to Dorcas copper. And then a uh, little blue stem, the host plant as well, uh, which, is, which is a grass there. So, um, you know, and in addition to having nectar plants around to draw in butterflies, um, you know, trying to hit some of these host plants is, is a great way to uh, help our butterfly species out. The, uh, I believe it's called the Native Plant Nursery out of Ann Arbor. Um, they post on their website a PDF of, it's a pretty comprehensive list of all of the um, host plants in Michigan, uh, which is a, is a great thing to uh, reference. 
And then uh, songbirds, um, is something else to think about as you're kind of designing and, and thinking about getting some native plants at home. And um, uh, songbirds can benefit from, from native plants in many ways. Um, uh, for you know nesting cover, uh, you know something like a shrub thicket is a great way to provide a nesting cover, and then many shrubs, um, you know, produce uh, edible fruits um, for birds. That's a common elderberry up there in the left, um, but uh, you know black chokeberry, um, many species of dogwoods, a high bush cranberry. It's incredible how the birds will will key on these plants and, and just strip them in, in uh, September when they start to ripen. Uh, some species like uh, Michigan holly or winterberry, um, you know, they'll often hit that uh, later in the winter. And uh, and then that's um, cutleaf coneflower. It's a rudbeckia there. Um, that's one of many species of, of wildflowers that have larger seeds that are often, um, you know, fed on by songbirds, uh, Coreopsis, Hori vervain, uh, many grass species as well. And then uh, nectar plants for hummingbirds, that's cardinal flower, uh, which is, is one of the favorites for hummingbirds, but they'll nectar on uh, many other Michigan native species as well. Um, and now kind of running through uh, some of the early, middle, and, and late species before we get into the, into the nitty gritty of, of planting here. Um, so in the spring, and we're actually starting to see some of these right now, which is a little crazy. Um, there's, um, I'm at the district office as well, and there was some bloodroot blooming that I walked by on the way in here, uh, which was, was pretty neat to see. Um, and that's a spring ephemeral, uh, bloodroot is. And their spring ephemerals are a, uh, uh, spring wildflower that that they typically start blooming before um, leaf cover uh, occurs in deciduous forests and then they fade uh, pretty quickly as summer approaches um, and and will kind of wilt and, and disappear um, but they're often our, our earliest uh, wildflowers um, so trillium as a lot of folks know uh, bloodroot wild geranium hepatica uh, there's there's many other um, spring ephemeral species um, we don't uh, sell a lot of these as they're they're really difficult to propagate from seed for the most part um, and typically when they're available it is um, uh, something like a plant rescue um, which I'm not sure if, if that's happening at the district sale this year or not it, okay great um, so that's that's a good way to get a hold of some spring ephemerals um, and uh, you know get them get them in your woodland and get get some early blooms um, and then um, some other uh, wildflowers that, that start to show um, blooming in color in the spring. Uh, if you look over there on the, on the upper right, um, in the far right of that right-hand corner is, is pussy toes. Um, and ours is blooming in the greenhouse, but isn't quite uh, you know, starting outside yet. And then uh, prairie smoke, which I showed that the closed bloom earlier, after it blooms, um, it turns upright and as the seed matures, um, it, it uh, forms those long styles that sort of look like uh, little like cotton candy uh, or little like cotton candy troll hair heads. Um, they're, they're pretty neat and uh, you know, definitely add some early interest to the garden. Uh, thimbleweed uh, below that to the left, um, a, a shade, pretty shade tolerant species that, that starts blooming really early and, and forms a neat uh, little seed head. Um, and then uh, spiderwort, which starts a little bit later in the spring, but, but blooms uh, pretty well into early summer. And then kind of looking at that list, which is not comprehensive, um, but, but it's some of the other, um, you know, fairly well-known spring bloomers like wild columbine. I talked about pussy tails and prairie smoke. Round leaf ragwort is one of the earliest. Uh, hairy beard tongue, uh, which I think in the next slide we'll see some photos of foxglove beard tongue, which is very similar but blooms a little bit later. Golden Alexanders, uh, wild strawberry, um, ours is starting to bloom in the greenhouse right now. Uh, lupin, um, and there's there's quite a few others to choose from. Um, so you can kind of select you know a few different plants with a few different colors and, and shapes to kind of give you a little bit of variety in the in the early spring. Moving a little later into spring, the foxglove beer tongue uh, starts blooming, and that's uh, over there on the right. Um, uh, all of the, the beer tongues are, are really uh, great garden plants. They're pretty low growing, uh, under a couple of feet, um, 
but they, they will set up a flowering stalk that's a little bit taller and can handle a variety of, of uh, light conditions. Um, you know, you can grow, uh, grow hairy beer tongue in, in pretty much full shade and it, and it does pretty well. A uh, foxglove can take pretty heavy shade also. Um, and the bees, bees uh, go crazy for them. It's pretty fun to watch the bees uh, wiggle in and out of those, those blossoms as they're, as they're pollinating them. And then that's uh, going kind of clockwise down around that San Coreopsis there, um, one of several native Coreopsis that we have. That's the earliest blooming. And if you did had that in your uh, garden, it'll bloom uh, well uh, through summer. Uh, geez, I think we have some that is still blooming in August some years. Uh, and uh, um, the if you leave the the heads to go to seed, um, the birds will get into the seed uh, pretty well, and it, and it does reseed also pretty aggressively. Um, another low growing uh, species there, and then that's Hori vervain up above it, uh, which I I really love. It's a a, a nice slow bloomer. Uh, you can see those those uh, blue flowers are about halfway up the the flowering stalk there, and they sort of slowly move their way up from uh, bottom to top and it, it has a really long bloom time. Um, and that seed is also eaten by, uh, by birds as well. And looking at the list, uh, you know, false indigos, uh, wild blue iris is another uh, early bloomer, um, spikenard, culver's root, yellow avens, and then many of your uh, fruiting shrubs like the dogwoods, um, and elderberry, nine bark, um, all bloom in, in sort of that late spring, early summer, you know, um, late May and, and through June uh, time frame. And then midsummer, um, really get a, a huge variety, and, and some species, you know, will just bloom uh, through for early summer, right through almost to fall. Um, but but really, kind of an endless plethora of choices. Um, up on the left there, it's is uh, some marsh blazing star. Those those wands. Um, there's several uh, blazing stars that are native to Michigan. Um, so so marsh blazing star there uh, does pretty well in in wet soil. Um, so it's a great shoreline or rain garden plant, but it but it can also handle dry conditions really well. And uh, northern blazing star is is fairly common in the uh, you know jack pine barren and savanna areas up here. Um, and uh, cylindrical blazing stars, it's this little cousin that, that stays a little bit shorter. Um, they're about, you know, just beautiful color in the summer and uh, really attractive to butterfly and bee species. Always, always busy plants in the summer. Behind them, you can see some gray headed cone flower and uh, some cup plant that's maybe just starting to open up there as well. Um, and then some bergamot down on the right behind that, that March blazing star. Next to that is, uh, in the next block over, is harebell, which uh, really starts blooming in early summer, but um, will bloom right through till fall. That's probably one of the most profusely blooming harebells I've ever seen. Um, usually they're a little bit sparser, um, but uh, really a, a beautiful, uh, very delicate looking plant, but can handle really harsh growing conditions. If you have a really dry, sandy spot, um, you know, that gets intense summer heat, um, you know, harebell really can can thrive there. Uh, next to that is is compass plant, um, a uh, a neat uh, it's a sophium. Uh, it's related to cup plant. Uh, they all have yellow blooms. A uh, pretty neat sort of sunflower looking plant, but has a really unique leaf shape. Uh, down in the the lower left, uh, black eyed susan. Everyone's pretty familiar with black eyed susan. Um, it's a great spreader and and reseeder. It's a fairly short lived. Um, I, you know, I read everywhere that it's a, it's a biennial, but, um, you know, I have, um, black eyed Susan that comes back year after year. I think it really can depend on, on the growing conditions, but, um, it, it reseeds so well that it, it tends to persist pretty well in the garden and, um, can handle the diversity of, of growing conditions, you know, can handle really dry soil. And then I, um, you know, see it quite a bit and I've been using it more as a stream bank plant. Um, you know, on drier uh, stream banks and, and lake shores, um, it does it does pretty well. Horse mint uh, is there next to it, and then uh, um, wild petunia, and uh, both of those are great lower growing uh, summer blooming plants, um, and both can handle you know really really hot dry conditions. Um, and that's something to 
you know, to really praise native plants for um, is their ability to handle, uh, you know, really difficult growing conditions without a lot of help from people. And uh, a lot of these midsummer plants are a great example of that. Um, we water very rarely, um, you know, what we have planted out at, at our farm and we have really dry sandy soil and um, many of these species, you know, really don't, don't suffer at all through it. Um, whereas, you know, a lot of cultivated, uh, you know, wildflowers or, or flower species and, and grasses, things that are used in the ornamental uh, trade are, are going to usually require a lot more pampering, uh, more nutritious soil, uh, more water. Um, you know, they've, they've adapted to uh, human help and human interference where, where these natives haven't. If you, you know, select the right plant for the right conditions, um, you know, they're going to do pretty well. And a long list there that I'm not going to run down on the right of, of many other um, species. And, uh, um, you know, we have some information on our, our website, which the link will be uh, for that at the end. Um, you know, our species list has some info as on sort of the bloom times and, and characteristics of, of the plants that we grow and sell. But um, the conservation district, um, uh, Northwest Michigan Invasive Species Network rather has some uh, really great native plant signs that they produce. Um, I'm not sure if that was touched on in the intro, but um, I know you can contact them if you're, if you're looking to get some signs for your garden. Um, and if you're coming to the plant sale um, this spring, uh, you know, we have that information on, on all the plants. So it, it's kind of a good way to help sort of pick out um, a good array to, to get you bloom throughout the whole year. And moving into fall, uh, many of the summer uh, blooming plants continue into early fall. Um, and then we have kind of a, a whole host of, of species that come on for that uh, sort of last uh, flourish before things turn to winter. And um, the most important of those are, are goldenrods and asters. Um, and there's a variety of, of goldenrod and aster species that are native to Michigan, you know, that can handle everything from sun, uh, full sun, dry soil, like showy goldenrod, which uh, is in that uh, upper left and uh, down on the, the lower right as well. Uh, stiff goldenrod, um, and then uh, some shorter goldenrods like, like uh, gray goldenrod and hairy goldenrod. Um, you know, they can handle full sun, dry conditions. Um, Riddell's goldenrod is well adapted to uh, wet soils. It's a great uh, rain garden plant. Uh, we also have some shade goldenrods. And goldenrods kind of get a bad rap. Um, and uh, luckily that seems to be changing a bit, but a lot of people blame them for allergies, um, which are actually caused by other plants like, like ragweed. Um, it's actually really impossible to be allergic to uh, goldenrod pollen as it's sticky and it, and it actually doesn't become airborne. So, um, you know, you'd need to, to break off a stem and, and um, you know, start rubbing it on your face, I think, to have any kind of reaction to the pollen. Um, so it's really not caused by goldenrods. They're just so showy in the fall when, when some people have those allergies that they, they get blamed. But they're really a, a great plant. Uh, lots of color, um, you know, lots of attraction uh, to insects. And they bloom uh, right up until things freeze um, hard. And, uh, you know, Canada goldenrod is, is a pretty common uh, aggressive goldenrod that you'll see on, you know, on roadsides and fields kind of everywhere. But there's, there's many native species that, that are really well behaved in the garden and, and really aren't going to, going to spread um, unless you really, um, you know, really try to get them to spread. Um, for asters uh, down there in the lower right, um, that sky blue aster, that, that light blue, um, really just an explosion of color in the fall. Um, and the New England aster behind it, um, up in the top right is, is um, swamp aster. It's also called uh, smooth swamp aster. And I think I see shining aster as a name used for it sometimes. Um, another great, uh, you know, aster for, for wet soils, just lots of color. They're just, you know, fantastic plants in the fall. Um, down on the lower left, a little bit more delicate uh, plants there, it's turtle head um, on, the, on the lower left. Um, uh, a uh, wetter soil, um, stream bank, shoreline, wetland uh, plant, and then um, bottle gentian next to it, which is I, one of my favorites. Um, and pretty versatile, you know, can handle some pretty dry soil if, if you give it a little bit of water um, in the 
during the driest spells. And you can also plant it, you know, on, on stream banks and shorelines and rain gardens. It stays pretty low growing. It's really unique um, blooms. They're pollinated mainly by bumblebees um, that can that can pry them open and, and get inside of that bloom. Um, and just really great color. Um, and several other species that will bloom, you know, pretty well into fall, like sneezeweed, ironweed, um, some of the sunflowers. So uh, lots of great options there. And it's a really good time of year to, to you know, be providing uh, nectar and pollen resources for insects before they either migrate or uh, go into winter dormancy. Looking at grasses here quick, uh, we basically have two different types of grasses uh, or groups of grasses in the state. And that's uh, cool season grasses and warm season grasses. And um, that really delineates when the grass uh, puts on most of its growth and, and blooms. So the cool season grasses, um, you know, start growing in the early part of the season um, when it's cooler. And um, they also uh, grow a little more vigorously again in the fall when things cool down. Um, a lot of your kind of common agricultural grasses and turf grasses are cool season grasses. Um, they don't handle the heat of summer very well. Um, but a couple of our native cool season grasses here are uh, prairie drop seed in the lower left and uh, June grass, uh, both nice low growing uh, grasses and, and uh, you know, really well behaved in the garden. Um, there are quite a few other, uh, you know, species. I think we'll look at some on the next page as well that are sort of technically cool season grasses. Uh, the sedges, for example. Um, also some I don't think I have photos of, uh, like uh, bottle brush grass, which is a, a shade or woodland grass, and um, Canada wild rye, another cool season grass. So up in the top row there, uh, little blue stem, big blue stem, and Indian, those are all warm season grasses as is switchgrass. Um, little blue stem is, is a really great uh, little grass. It's uh, very adaptable, can handle really dry conditions, um, grows about two to three feet tall, and um, you know has a really just beautiful silvery green color throughout the summer, and then turns a tawny coppery color in the fall. That's really feathery seed heads. Um, and uh, it's it's just a great great grass to have around. Um, big blue stem and Indian grass are both quite a bit taller. They can get in the you know up to the five to six foot range. Um, and switchgrass is is a, a, almost the same height. Switchgrass usually likes it a little bit wetter, um, but grasses form a really nice backdrop in a garden or um, you know borders. And uh, they just provide a little bit of different texture and help fill in, um, you know, spaces if you have a large space to fill in. Um, and they provide great cover for wildlife. Um, many butterfly species will actually form their chrysalis on grass stems, um, uh, like monarchs typically do. So it's it's really good to have some uh, grasses mixed in there with your with your wildflowers um, for for those reasons. Looking at some sedges um, in the top row, uh, top left, uh, both those photos are Pennsylvania sedge uh, or Penn sedge. Um, grows about six to eight inches tall maximum. You don't need to mow it. Um, some folks are, are installing it in places as sort of a no mow lawn. It doesn't handle foot traffic, like a lot of foot traffic very well, but if it's an area that you're not, um, you know, walking on a lot, uh, Penn sedge can do, do pretty well there. Um, and can grow from full sun to, to full shade. Uh, it is pretty slow uh, to spread. So, you know, to plant, plant a lawn would, would take a lot of, um, a lot of sedge. Uh, brown fox sedge down the lower left um, gets about two to three foot tall clumps and has that sort of fox tail. Um, it's a great shoreline or wetland sedge, but, but can handle dry soils as well. Uh, fringe sedge, another good wetland shoreline sedge. And then over on the right, a couple of uh, species of bulrush, dark green bulrush and wool grass um, are, are really nice um, options for, for wetter soils. So now looking at, um, you know, what it takes to, to get some native plants at your place, uh, what kind of steps you might want to go through. And the first step uh, it really is looking at the site uh, that you're looking to plant. You know, what is the soil like? Um, is it dry sand? Is it heavy clay? Um, you know, we have species for, for all of that in the state. Um, 
Uh, no matter what your soil type is, I guarantee there's a Michigan native species that's adapted to it, but you want to figure that out first. Um, and then, uh, you know, is it, is it dry? Is it wet? Um, really nice if you can kind of think about the site through the whole growing season, you know, does it, is it seasonally wet in the spring? Um, does it flood uh, during rain events? Might it be a good place to put in a rain garden, which we'll, we'll look at those a little bit more specifically in a minute. Um, uh, does it really dry out and bake in the summer? Um, those are all things you want to think about. And, and you have a little bit of leeway. Um, you know, you can water, obviously, if it gets really dry. Um, but, uh, you know, it's best to try to select plants that are adapted for, for the soil moisture and, and type. Um, slope can can make a bit of a difference. Um, you know, it, if you're sloping to the south, um, you know, the aspect can, it can really uh, get quite a bit hotter in the summer. Um, I think I've heard, I, I might be, have my figures off a little bit, but I think something like a 10% slope to the south is equivalent to being 300 miles south of your latitude, um, as opposed, you know, compared to flat ground. Um, it can make a pretty big difference. Um, on the growing conditions to the north or the south. That's just something to think about. And uh, lighting is, is a big one. And, uh, you know, what, how much light, uh, how many hours of the day do you get light at the site? And then uh, what time of the day, um, you know, does it get midday sun um, or not? And uh, generally, you know, you're going to have an easier time growing shade tolerant species in more sun. Um, then you are growing a lot of your full sun prairie plants in, in, in heavy shade. Some plants you can get away with quite a bit of shade, but they tend to look um, just sort of unhealth, unhealthy, unhappy. They don't bloom as much. They look a little like they were uh, grown in a cave. Um, but, uh, you know, you want to select species that are adapted for uh, shade um, in that case. And, um, you know, that can be a tough thing to work with. We get a lot of uh, questions from folks every year, um, you know, and they usually start with, I have this uh, clump of pine trees or hemlock trees and nothing grows under it. What can I plant there? And, um, you know, some of those places are really challenging places to get plants to establish. You know, there's probably a reason that nothing is already growing there. Um, you know, you might have really heavily acidic soil, uh, might be really compacted, um, you know, so you want to, you want to kind of think about that, uh, before you go, um, you know, putting a lot of expensive plants in, or seed in, in there. Um, and then, uh, existing vegetation as I, you know, kind of carrying on to what I just mentioned, um, you know, are there already plants growing there, um, that you need to remove? And, um, that's sort of the next step and, and kind of one of the bigger hurdles to overcome potentially. So here's sort of a quick uh, view of, uh, you know, an example residence and, and you can kind of see going around the house where you might have different growing conditions and how you might want to select different plants for those. Um, so, you know, the north side of the house might be where you have more shade, um, you know, good, good place to put uh, more shade tolerant plants or maybe plants that could handle, uh, you know, want wetter soil, they're not going to dry out as much. The same with the east side um, where you're going to get sun, but you're going to get it more in the morning. So it's not as hot. It's not as intense. Um, so if you're going to be growing, uh, you know, maybe more shade tolerant plants in, in the open, uh, putting them on the east side uh, where they're going to be shaded from that really intense midday and afternoon sun is a, is a good idea. Then the south and west sides, um, you know, where you're going to get you know, the more intense uh, midday sun and heat, things tend to dry up more in the summer. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're, it's a great place to put uh, pollinator gardens and full sun prairie plants, but, um, you know, you might need to pay attention to uh, watering a little bit more in those areas. So site preparation, uh, removing the existing vegetation, if, if you have to, um, you know, let's say you're, um, turning your lawn into uh, a native plant garden, which is a great idea, um, but you got to get rid of your lawn. So how do you go about that? And you have a few different options. Um, the, the quick and easy approach, um, and, and in a lot of ways, the most effective would be to use an herbicide. Um, and, uh, you know, probably the most effective out there is a, you know, glyphosate based herbicide like Roundup. It's pretty widely available. 
Um, they don't tend to persist very long in the soil, um, so you have you know pretty low window of time where they're where they're potentially harmful. Um, and they, they are very effective, uh, but you still, uh, you know, it's not going to be a weekend project start to finish. Um, you know, really you want to spray uh, with the herbicide um, and uh, let it work in uh, to the soil, kill all the plants. Um, uh, then the herbicide dissipates after, uh, you know, really a few hours, I think it starts to become inert and the plants die. You want to give it a week or two to make sure everything dies. Um, you might need to spray again if there are some particularly uh, aggressive species in there. Um, then you would move on uh, to prepping it from there. Um, obviously, you want to wear all the protective equipment um, and you know make sure that you're being safe uh, doing that. If you want to avoid using herbicide, which um, I you know definitely support, if that that's what you want to do, that's that's a great option. Um, there's plenty of other ways to prep a site. They just require a little more time and a, a little more elbow grease. Um, so cultivation, um, you know, using a rototiller, uh, or you could even you know dig it up with a pitchfork. Um, we, we've had luck putting in garden beds, um, you know, with just cultivation. And uh, we use a pretty heavy duty rototiller, like a tractor mounted three point rototiller or a really heavy duty um, gas powered walk behind. And it usually requires um, multiple tillings and, and, a, and a good length of time. Really you wanna do um, pretty shallow tills after the first time. So you're not bringing up new weed seed. So weed seed can, the top two to three inches, um, weed seed can germinate from. So if you're tilling deeper than that, you're bringing up seed um, to then germinate again. Uh, but if you can uh, sort of make passes over it every, you know, every few weeks or a month as you're seeing new things germinate, but you're staying shallow, you can, uh, you know, kill, kill off that, that um, weed seed load that's there. Um, and a lot of uh, grasses, you know, the, the rhizomes and roots of grasses, you're going to need to tease out by hand. Um, so it can be done. It just just requires a lot of work and, and kind of the right site for it. Um, cover crops can even help a bit too. Um, you know, if you had had the better part of a season to work with, uh, you could plant something like oats, which would help keep uh, those weed seeds from from growing up. Burning uh, can work, uh, especially on larger larger plots um, to get rid of unwanted vegetation. And then smothering is, a, is another uh, really successful uh, method and is, uh, requires a little bit less work than something like cultivation, but a little, a lot more time. So smothering is when you would use, um, you can use a variety of things, cardboard, newspaper, landscape fabric, um, probably the best, uh, most successful thing to use would be clear plastic and you cover the area that you want to plant um, and uh, you, you leave it and the heat of the sun um, will kill uh, the vegetation in there. I say clear plastic is the best because it actually gets the hottest, even hotter than a, than a black plastic would. Um, and then ideally what you would do is, is uh, leave the plastic on um, you know, for a month or so and, and let it kill that vegetation. Then you would pull the plastic off for a couple of weeks, let things germinate, you know, weed seed germinate, and then put the plastic back on and, and, and do a couple of rounds. Um, so sort of a good timing to do that would be you know, to do that throughout the, the hottest part of summer and then do a fall planting. Um, or uh, you know prep it through the summer and then and then plant the the plot the next spring, uh, but you really need that you know hot sun. Although lately we start getting that in in May sometimes, so who knows. And then um, after you've removed the vegetation, and uh, you know have you don't need to to till the soil if you're just smothering or using herbicide. Um, uh, you know there you can plant with a with a shovel or a spade or a, a ball bogger uh, without tilling and bringing up weed seed. Um, so you don't necessarily need to, to cultivate the soil. But if you're going to mulch, you want to mulch before you plant. Um, it's a lot easier to uh, clear a space in the mulch and plant into that than it is to um, uh, try to get a truckload of mulch around, um, you know, hundreds of, of small seedlings without stepping on them or burying them. So get your mulch there first. Um, you could use bark, um, double ground, uh, red pine is, is a good option. Um, really try to avoid the dyed, um, crazy color mulches if you can. 
Lord knows what's in those things. And, and it's hard to believe that they're good for insects. Um, and uh, straw is another option, um, you know, for a less formal garden, or if you really are planning to let uh, plants spread. Um, and uh, shredded leaves work well for uh, woodland uh, plantings also. Or you could just forego uh, mulching altogether and try to cover the ground with plants, which is a great approach. Uh, ground covers like wild strawberry, uh, species, low growing species like pussy toes, uh, clematis will work as a ground cover. Um, there's lots of species that you could, you could try to take up some of that space with. Um, you know, mulching really heavily has some benefits for us and that it keeps down weed growth. Um, if you want to keep things really neat and organized, uh, you know, your plants aren't going to spread. Um, but, and uh, it also reduces watering needs, but, um, you know, it makes it a lot harder for ground nesting insects to get in and out of the ground. Um, uh, it can be a little ugly, you know, you're, you're looking at piles of shredded bark instead of plants, but, um, you know, you really have a lot of options as to how you want to, how you want to set it up and how tightly you want to plant things or how much you want to mulch. And um, lastly, some sort of weed guard or edging is worth considering if you're putting in a, a garden that's gonna be surrounded by, uh, you know, something like lawn, um, you know, that grass will start to creep in even under your mulch. Um, and you can use plastic uh, weed guard, you know, it's, you can buy it in rolls and uh, put that in. Uh, we use uh, cedar boards sometimes and, you know, you bury them so that just a, a couple inches is above the soil. So you have a few different options there depending on uh, the look that you're going for. Or you could not put an edging and just uh, know you'll probably have to weed, weed those edges every year. So moving on to installation, um, going with sort of the least expensive option, um, uh, you know, seeds. So if you're really gonna do a larger planting, uh, like putting in a small prairie, uh, seeds could be a great way to go where you're, you know, really just going over going with getting as much quantity out there as you can. Um, the thing about a lot of, about our native plant species is they've adapted to, um, you know, to the conditions um, that they have to, to tolerate and uh, try to germinate in. So they're very different than a lot of cultivated species that, um, you know, you, you put in the soil and, and add water and sun and they're, and they're going to germinate. Um, a lot of our native plant species require, most of them require uh, what's called stratification, a cold moist stratification. And basically it's a period um, that it's a process where they uh, break the dormancy of the plants and it sort of simulates uh, lying under the snow through the winter. So uh, most of our wildflower species, you know, require cold stratification. And the way we do that is we, we put them in a, in a Ziploc bag, um, mix them with some potting soil, get it pretty damp. Um, I like it so that it, it clumps up but not quite where it's dripping. Um, I find that things stratify a little bit better when they're on the wetter side, but you can have some problems with, um, you know, with mold occasionally. And then I put them in the refrigerator for, uh, you know, length of time that's required. Um, and that is anywhere from 120 days for something like uh, iris to uh, 30 days for, um, you know, like some, most of the milkweeds. And, uh, and then some species uh, don't require stratification, um, like uh, bergamot, horse mint, uh, most grasses. And uh, those, you know, you can direct seed in the spring, but the species that require stratification, if you, you know, purchase them and just, and, and scatter them in the spring, they wouldn't germinate until the following uh, year. Uh, the following spring. And in that time, you know, insects and birds and wind and everything else would have their way with them. So uh, if you're going to seed, um, it's really better to source the seeds in the fall and uh, stratify them yourself and then and then seed them in the spring. Um, uh, some species actually require all kinds of other crazy stuff. We pour boiling water on some seeds um, and then stratify them. Uh, I have uh, a whole bunch of hybrid cranberry that just germinated this year that I seeded 
uh, two or three years ago and, and kind of just forgot about, left that out by the hedgerow. And uh, that requires uh, several warm and cold stratification cycles. And then they just all erupted uh, this spring, which was pretty neat to see. Um, so that's that's something to think about is that it's it's possible to uh, start a garden from seed, but uh, you know there's a lot of steps involved and um, things are going to be a lot slower to establish. Um, you know, a greenhouse growth seedling um, can often bloom in the first year. If it's something that you direct sowed outside, um, that's often not the case, um, although it does depend on the species. So plugs are um, sort of the next uh, option in terms of scale. Um, and the, the garden kits, the plant by number flats, um, like that you can order through the conservation district, those are a, a plug um, as pictured there. Uh, I think they're about five inches deep, um, two and three quarters inches in diameter. And, um, you know, that really allows that seedling to get really well rooted out. Um, and a lot of people get worried about these species looking root bound. Um, I've never found that to be a problem. Um, they can just be a mass of roots and you, you put them in the ground and, and they'll just take off. Um, I'd rather have something that's really rooted out and has ugly tops that are starting to go dormant and die back um, than, than something that has uh, you know really beautiful foliage, but uh, the plug isn't very well rooted out. They just tend to, tend to take off a lot more. Um, and uh, you, know, you can plant uh, plugs and quarts and gallons, um, you know, even when they're going dormant in the fall or if they're still dormant in the spring, um, and they, they will typically do very well. You know, all of these native perennials are really long-lived plants. Um, and uh, you know they they will uh, can be planted dormant in the fall and hold up really well over the winter and uh, and will take right off in the spring. Um, so really, it's the roots that you want to think about and that you want to pay attention to. Um, so plugs, you know, are a lot quicker to establish than seeds, and um, you know can give you blooms often in your first year. Um, they're a little cheaper than larger size containers, um, and they're pretty quick and easy to plant. That uh, what that little device there chucked into that drill, that's a ball bogger. And uh, I think that's maybe a three or three and a half inch ball bogger and a really quick, easy way to plant plugs. Um, you know, if you have two people working as a team, um, you can just go along with one person drilling and somebody else just drops the plug in and, and, uh, and uh, pass the soil around them. And you can plant uh, a pretty big area pretty quickly. Uh, you can buy those augers and up to like a four foot length or something, so you don't even have to have to bend over, and you can uh, just plant away. And uh, thinking about um, spacing a little bit, um, really, it's it's kind of up to you as to how um, you know how tightly you want to pack things. It's going to give you a, a fuller looking garden uh, right off the the get-go um, but you know it's going to require more plants um, but generally around uh, one uh, wildflower per square foot um, and then grasses uh, sort of like one per for every three square feet again this varies quite a bit if you're looking at taller species or shorter species another rule of thumb uh, we go by quite a bit is kind of one and a half times the plant height in terms of, of spacing you know if, if you're looking at something that's uh, going to get five to six feet tall you want to give it a lot of room and you also don't want to be planting you know shorter species right right under it so um, just kind of taking that into account um, as you're as you're planting things and, and thinking about uh, planting them um, many of these species can get some some pretty big roots and don't like to be moved uh, some species don't mind it as much but um, you know it's a, another good reason to kind of think things out before you before you plant and then uh, maintenance, uh, you know, you want to monitor for weeds uh, before it gets out of hand, like in that photo. Um, I think I see some gray-headed coneflower in there, but mostly I see a whole bunch of uh, Queen Anne's lace and just all kinds of uh, what you don't want. Um, and it's pretty hard to to uh, get back to, to baseline uh, once you've let it get out of hand like that. But, uh, you know, usually just uh, periodic, um, you know, weeding in the spring and a few times throughout the year, you can you can stay on top of it. And uh, you know, removing litter in the spring, um, you you really want to wait until the soil warms up into the 50s before you do that. Um, uh, a lot of insects nest and overwinter in uh, plant stems and in the debris on the ground. Um, 
you can, you know, what I've heard from ecologists is that most of those species really nest right at ground level or below ground level in the stems. So uh, if you really can't stand the mess, um, you know, you could trim things back. Ideally, you would just trim things back to about 15 inches or so above the soil. And ideally, you would even leave those through the next growing season um, because that's going to provide some uh, habitat for insects as well. But um, either way, uh, you know, don't get in there and, and rake everything up and, and uh, throw it out in the, in the trash, um, you know, at this point in the spring because you might be throwing away a lot of uh, dormant insects. But you can clip things back, uh, you know, rake mow, burn, weed whip, it really depends on whether we're talking, uh, uh, you know, prairie planting or a, or a formal garden. Um, and then, um, you know, burning can even be a good option or grazing on, on a larger uh, planting as well to remove some of that uh, dead plant material. Um, you know, a lot of these species have adapted to that and, and actually respond really well to spring or, or fall burns. And I mentioned rain gardens earlier, um, which is a, a pretty specific type of, of uh, garden to install and a, a great um, thing to look into if you have a, an area that, that uh, gets really wet during rain events or that sort of runoff area and creating a depression or working with a natural depression that's already there. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you may need to excavate, but I've seen some great rain gardens that are just installed in an already existing depression as well. Um, uh, you know, if it's heavy soil, a good option would be to excavate and then mend that soil, add some sand and some compost that helps it drain better. But really you're just looking at taking a depression, um, helping it serve as sort of a catchment for runoff. Um, and uh, allowing it to, uh, that runoff to absorb into the ground. Um, and then you will plant it with plants that can tolerate that, um, you know, seasonal flooding or occasional flooding, but also dry out a little bit. Um, so things like uh, pictured there on the top right is mountain mint, uh, sneezeweed in the center, and then this great blue lobelia on the bottom. Those are um, uh, just a few of, of many uh, good rain plant plants. Um, your more uh, moisture tolerant plants in the center and then uh, a little bit drier plants up on, on the slopes. And um, you want to size these ideally for the amount of runoff that you might be receiving, um, you know, off of a parking lot or a roof or a lawn. Um, lawns don't absorb water uh, very well at all um, compared to native uh, plantings. So you can uh, see a tremendous amount of rain runoff even from lawns. Um, a good uh, resource to source these is uh, down at the bottom of the page there, Tip of the Mint Watershed Council. They're out of the uh, Petoskey area. They have a great uh, little um, uh, pamphlet on sizing rain gardens and you can kind of calculate the size based on the area that you're draining. Um, but uh, really uh, can be a, a, good, a good thing to do. See a lot of them going into uh, public parks and, and um, schools and places like that uh, where, you know, there are continual um, issues with, with stormwater runoff. Um, a good way to, to solve some of those runoff issues and um, also helps keep things that are washing off of your lawns and parking lots and roads from, from running directly into uh, lakes and streams um, as well. And then lastly here, uh, stream bank and shoreline plantings. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have um, been hearing about, you know, a lot of the increased um, flooding and erosion with the, with the high lake levels along Lake Michigan. It's been a little, uh, little sad to see um, some folks not getting steered towards native plantings, but luckily a lot of folks are. Um, of course, once, uh, you know, you've, you've lost half of your, your property, it's, it probably feels a little late for that, but um, you know, putting in hard uh, riprap and seawall um, methods of erosion control, um, you know, really aren't the greatest option. Um, it really depends on the site. Uh, sometimes I know that that it's a little bit necessary, but um, you know, often those hard structures will deflect um, wave energy and flood action, and they'll actually just deflect it to an unprotected area of the shoreline and will just increase the erosion there. So really the best thing to do is, is to uh, try to create as much of a natural buffer as you can along that shoreline. 
Um, and fortunately, we're seeing these, uh, you know, really grow in, in popularity um, in the area. Uh, we have a lot of uh, beautiful water resources in Michigan, and it's it's nice to see folks appreciate, um, you know, native plants as, as something that can really add to the beauty of those um, over mowed lawn or, or seawall. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a plethora of species that can work for uh, stream bank or shoreline plantings. Um, really, you want to look at it like any other uh, planting site. Uh, what are the soil conditions? Um, you know, it might be uh, really low, uh, wet, um, mucky uh, planting, and, and we have species for that. Um, things like iris in the top right, wild blue iris, and um, dark green bulrush to the left of that uh, can be, you know, submerged even um, in, you know, a few inches of water and they can take uh, seasonally flooded and really wet areas. Uh, Blue vervain um, down below um, can be, can be very wet as well. Um, and Joe pie over in the lower right, uh, but you could uh, plant other species a little further up the bank where it's drier, things like black eyed Susan, um, shrubs, even dry land species. Uh, you're really trying to create a buffer where those roots are holding the soil in place, um, protecting it from erosion, and then you're uh, filtering runoff and it's providing uh, that habitat for, um, for uh, wildlife. And uh, yeah, it's, they're just they're just great options. You can pick lower growing plants that aren't going to block your view um, if that's what you're after, or um, you know if you are trying to uh, get some taller vegetation in there. Uh, you know, shrubs. Uh, a lot of shrubs are adapted to grow on on shorelines and stream banks as well. Um, so lots of good good options there. And there are quite a few um, outfits in the area that do, um, you know, professional folks that do install um, shoreline buffers and, and do that type of work. Um, I know a few of them you can find through the, the Go Beyond Beauty listing as well. Um, so a lot of uh, really talented people in the area that could help you install something like that. And um, so wrapping up here, uh, looking at a few resources that I recommend. Um, there are a lot of, of uh, great books on uh, gardening with native plants, but just a few that, that I really like. Um, Bringing Nature Home uh, by Doug Tallamy um, is, a, is a great um, resource. And he has a, a new book uh, that just came out last year as well. That's Nature's Best Hope. Um, Bringing Nature Home has a little bit more nuts and bolts um, information in it on, uh, you know, creating as, as much of a um, wildlife magnet and wildlife friendly environment as your backyard as you can with, with native plants. Uh, really great information there and uh, sort of, um, you know, builds on um, his sort of concepts of, of sort of this, um, you know, backyard national park. I'm not sure if I'm quite getting that right, but um, the idea that if, you know, everyone's lawns and backyards across America would, you know, be larger than, than any national park that we have. Um, and that it's, it's really, we need to think of it not so much as these um, small disconnected areas, but really is this space that, that really could be benefiting, um, you know, the ecosystems and, and nature around us, um, as well as being a, a place where, where we want to spend time. And uh, Landscaping with Native Plants of Michigan is a great uh, Michigan specific book. Um, lots of good species lists, uh, photos, and, and kind of stuff to get, get the wheel, wheels turning, um, as well as a lot of how-to um, as well. Pollinators, Native Plants, uh, one of several books by Heather Holm, um, some really informative books on um, insect and plant interactions um, you know, even if you're not a uh, scientist or a biologist, you can you can really get a lot of, of great information out of those books um, and, you know, step out in your backyard and, and see a lot of the things uh, firsthand. Newcomb's Wildflower Guide is, is one of my favorite ID books, really easy to use. Um, you don't need a, a PhD to, to be able to use, use it. Um, very easy uh, way to key out and identify plants uh, by composition. And then some web resources, um, obviously the Northwest Michigan Invasive Species Network and, and Go Beyond Beauty, as we learned about back in the intro. Um, I'm not sure if they mentioned uh, that on the Go Beyond Beauty website, there's a listing of um, native, the native plant nurseries, participating nurseries and landscapers um, in our area. So that's a great way to um, you know, get a, 
get a hold of other native plants or get a hold of landscapers that work with natives. Um, and then uh, Plant It Wild, a Northwest Michigan based um, organization that uh, promotes uh, the use of native plants in landscapes. A lot of good resources there. And um, at least pre COVID, they hosted a, a lot of workshops and events throughout the year. And, and hopefully we'll get back to that soon as well. And then uh, a couple of good uh, online databases that um, we use quite a bit to get info on native plants, um, michiganflora.net. Uh, pretty much every native plant species in the state is covered in there. Um, you can find out what counties they're native to, um, and uh, it's a good way to help identify uh, native plants, and uh, as well as uh, Michigan Natural Features Inventory, a lot of really good information on there as well. Um, and that's a clematis or virgin's bower in the top right, uh, a vining um, plant, blooms midsummer. Um, it uh, forms a, a ground cover if it doesn't have anything to climb on and has some really gorgeous feathery seed heads in the fall. And then rattlesnake master down below that, which is one of the, the better named native plants, uh, Southwest Michigan prairie plant, but uh, grows really well up here in gardens and um, uh, it's very unique um, and uh, draws a lot of pollinators in as well. And uh, that's about it. Um, Feel free to you know get a hold of us if uh, I can answer any other questions for you. And uh, for folks in the Traverse City area, um, we're uh, um, going to be at the Native Plant Sale here at the Boardman River Nature Center on May 22nd. Uh, we also do plant sales with uh, numerous other conservation districts in Northwest Michigan, um, and then a few other uh, organizations like Grass River Nature Center, um, FU down in Ludington. Um, so we're, we're all over and uh, you can visit our website uh, for more information on, on uh, other sales that we'll be at throughout the year. But uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you, Garrett. We do have some questions though, so you don't get off scot-free, sorry. <laughs> um, first up, we have a question about, here, let me find the exact wording. Um, I don't know the name of the plant, but I've heard it called sedum. It starts green brown, turns bright yellow, and every year I see it spread more and more in my neighborhood and in the yards. Is it invasive or a native plant? And if it's invasive, what's the best way to get rid of it? Katie, you might know a little might know a little more about sedum than I do. I mean, I I'm familiar with it, um, but yeah, I can take it if you like. Okay. I just wanted to put it out there. So uh, this is. Uh, sedum, you're correct. It's called sedum acre. If you want the whole Latin name, it's not too tricky. Um, this is not a native plant. Uh, it is pretty aggressive in yards, as you've seen. We don't classify it as an invasive species at this point because it doesn't appear to be causing harm to ecosystems or human health or um, the uh, economy other than perhaps is turf, you know, it is definitely invading those turf areas. So the invasive species network doesn't have tons of good tips. Um, the species is pretty resistant to herbicides. So there's not a lot of really good um, herbicides out there. The best uh, methods I've seen have been to uh, just hand pull it, which could be a really daunting task. Um, but I would say overall, since it's not causing harm to the environment and actually might be improving the habitat in their, your yard, if you just have, um, you know, a, a full lawn of uh, Kentucky bluegrass, there's not a lot of habitat there. So if you do have some, um, you know, when it's blooming, it's, it's food for pollinators. It's not as good as native plants, obviously. Um, but I would, as, as an invasive species, biologist, I would say, uh, not not the biggest worry ever, but hand pulling can certainly be um, probably your best way forward there. Yeah, I don't think I've ever really seen it outside of lawns. Um, you know, you usually don't see it escape out in, into ecosystem, native ecosystems. So. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, next question's for you, Garrett. Can so, you transplant natives? Um, we have a lot of property and wondered if I should try and move some plants into my garden area. Yes, you can. Um, it's really important to try to get all the roots. Um, and, you know, some species uh, like, like lead plant or uh, New Jersey tea put down some, some really uh, deep tap roots. Um, 
So, you know, I would, I would bring a good shovel and, and maybe even a digging bar and try to get as much of that out as you can. Um, the best times to do that, in my opinion, are, you know, early or late in the season. Um, trying to move plants uh, during the heat of the summer can be, can be really uh, challenging. Um, one thing that we do when we're moving plants often is um, we'll dig them up and instead of uh, transplanting them into the ground, I'll pot them up um, into a, you know, even a, up to a five gallon pot or something. But if, if you can, if they're smaller and you can get them in a one gallon pot, uh, but I'll pot them up and um, put them somewhere that's a little bit shady for a few days until they uh, start to recover from that shock. And then uh, you can sort of pamper them um, throughout the growing season um, in, in that pot and then transplant them uh, when, you know, you feel like the timing's right. Um, I tend to have a little more success that way than, than just um, digging them up and transplanting them. But you can certainly do it, you know, just try to get all the roots and um, really be, pay attention to watering them well after you've transplanted. Good pro tips, thank you. Um, I live in a wooded area and have issues with deer eating whatever I plant. Will deer leave native plants alone or eat them even more? Uh, that's a tough one. And uh, yeah, I didn't, didn't mention that in my uh, program there. So thank you for bringing that up because that's a, a very common question from folks. Um, deer will try just about anything. Um, it really can kind of depend on how much deer pressure you have. Um, there are uh, some, there is some good information out there on more deer resistant species. Um, some of the, some of the species that, uh, you know, I know of offhand, uh, lobelias, they tend to uh, leave alone. Um, plants in the allium or onion family, um, like nodding wild onion, uh, minty plants, they'll tend to leave alone or uh, very uh, florally smelling the, where the foliage smells kind of floral. So um, like horse mint and bergamot, uh, mountain mint. Actually in the, in the photo on my screen there is New England Aster, which has a very um, florally smelling and fuzzy leaf. They tend to leave that alone. Um, but I've also seen them eat New England Aster. So uh, we, we have uh, some friends that live in downtown Grayling and have just unbelievable deer pressure. And they're sort of our secret laboratory for um, for plants and, and it's incredible what they'll, what they'll mow down. Um, but uh, I would take a look at um, uh, that Landscaping with Michigan Native Plants book I'd mentioned. She has some good um, deer resistant species recommendations in there as well. And then some of the larger uh, native plant nurseries that have online databases, um, you know, you can, you can Google some species that you're, you're interested in. Um, but there are quite a few, you know, lead plants, another one that they tend to leave alone. But, um, it, it can be a challenge. Um, another recommendation would be to plant some of those smellier species that the deer aren't drawn to sort of in the, around the perimeter of your garden, that might help. Um, so, you know, like nodding wild onion, um, wild leeks um, or ramps. Um, they really don't like that, that, that oniony smell. Um, and then beyond that, uh, geez, electric fencing maybe. <laughs> Absolutely. I did add, um, ISN has a short list of um, spe native species that might be a little more deer resistant. And so I put that link in the chat. It is not foolproof and it's also not complete. I'm sure there are plenty of other resistant plants out there. Um, that's just one list that we have. Um, but thank you, Garrett. Yeah, and it, it is such a difference of like, I don't know, how bad are your deer? <laughs> Um, next question, um, probably another question for me. Are lilacs invasive? Some conservation districts sell them, but it's listed on the Missin site. You want me to go for that? Sure, you probably know more about All that right. than me. Uh, so lilacs are right on the edge. Um, they often don't spread a lot. Most times we see them growing in the wild in areas that are um, homesteads, you know, historic homesteads, even if the, the house is gone. Um, they're listed on Missin because it's in that gray area. We're not really sure. We, we do see it sometimes spreading and very thickly. Um, and so it's just kind of, it's on Missin so that we can be aware of it. And so people can be reporting things so we can pay attention. And if we notice a change, we can make stronger recommendations. Um, 
different conservation districts have made different choices in which species that they sell. So the Grand Traverse Conservation District and the conservation districts um, that ISN work with, Benzie, Lilina, and Manistee, all sell strictly native plants um, and seedlings because that's what um, we have found to be the most supportive of conservation goals. But other conservation districts may be coming at things from a different angle. So um, yeah, kind of, kind of a funny one there. Um, next question has been mostly answered in the chat. Someone has a problem with glossy buckthorn on the stream bank. Um, and Shelly went in there and added some links, which is, thank you so much for doing that, Shelly. Um, but uh, basically, you, there's, there's some great links on ISN's website. And as well, there's a really amazing website called woodyinvasives.org for the Woody Invasives of the Great Lakes Collaborative. And they've just got some incredible resources about control and um, alternatives as well, native alternatives. Uh, to some of these invasive species. Um, what, all right, one last question here. What would be a woody vine that strangles trees found in wet areas? Native. Um, I wouldn't know of any that strangle trees, but I mean, you know, you might see clematis or, um, you know, would, would probably be the most common woody vine that you'd see. Sometimes there are some native hops, but I'm guessing it could be something non-native that they're talking about yeah maybe we don't have a lot of strangling oh well uh oriental bittersweet the invasive bittersweet can strangle although most often our vines here um whether they're native or invasive um may cause problems by uh overtopping trees and and um, out competing them and with native species that's kind of part of the um, checks and balances of nature, you know, um, maybe this, it, it, the vine will then help make a gap in the canopy, um, and that will kill the, the vine, but then other trees are able to grow in, um, whereas when it's an invasive species, it can move a lot faster, and there's nothing keeping it in check, um, so it can cause a lot of problems, uh, so some other options, I mean, you see grapevines overtopping trees sometimes, and, and, and if you're managing for timber, these vines can be a big problem because they can make the trees grow crooked or whatever. Um, if you're not managing for like super tall straight trees, the vines are, are just a wonderful part of the ecosystem. They a lot of times have fantastic berries or seeds like Garrett talked about. So, yeah. Um, I have a couple of questions that I thought of Garrett. Sure. Are you up for it? Okay. Um, this year is weird. And it's like a million degrees out already, or at least it feels like it sometimes. Uh, and so, you know, we talked about not cleaning out our beds too early. Do you have any tips for a weird year where it was 80 degrees a couple days ago? Like, should we be cleaning out our beds? Should we still be waiting? Yeah, that's that's a tough one. I mean, I haven't cleaned my beds out yet because we're so busy in the greenhouse. So I don't have to worry about that. We always clean them out too late. But I think generally a good rule of thumb um, is when you start to see um, a lot of dormant plants emerging. Um, and that's really a good time to be cleaning up the garden anyways, um, you know, because then you kind of know where things are and you can work around them. Um, and, you know, I, I also feel like you could be a little more lenient with it if you're, you maybe live in the country and you're not like disposing of your um, leaf litter and things like that um you know in the trash but but you're maybe just you know putting them in the hedgerow out back or something but um i think the you know in a weird year really that rule of thumb is is probably just wait until the plants start really responding um and, and start emerging um you know things like your asters and golden rods and stuff start start coming up out of that that dead plant material and then you know that, that it's probably probably okay and again, just always, you know, if you have to go, if you feel like you have to go early, erring on the side of, of um, leaving, uh, you know, a few inches of dead plant stem um, is, is really a good idea. Good tips, thank you. Good question. Um, a question we always get during the native plant sale is, um, I just bought these native plants. Do they need to be hardened off before I plant them? Hmm. Most of our stock gets hardened off, um, you know, before we sell it. Um, and, uh, you know, a good good deal of, of what's bought like at the plant sales is second year stock. 
Um, so it was actually grown out the year before. That is usually really freeze hardy. Um, you know, it might get damaged by a freeze, but um, it's not going to kill it. Um, the exception to that might be small plugs um, that are that are first year, um, and you know. <sighs> I think that you could have problems if we had a late freeze. Um, even if they've been hardened off, they're they're still they still might be successful. And we had a killing frost at our nursery on June thirteenth last year, uh, which was crazy because we had had you know ninety degree weather prior to that. But last year was just all over the place, um, and this year might be too. So um, if you think you're going to get a frost and you just bought uh, you know a bunch of plugs. Um, it might be a good idea to just throw a sheet or something over them. It really doesn't take much because they are, they are very hardy, but if, uh, you know, you planted out a flat of, of first year mountain mint and, uh, you know, we had a 25 degree night, um, you might lose some. So, a uh, simple covering like that, uh, don't go with something like plastic, um, but, you know, fabric material, either a row cover that's made for it or even an old sheet will, will do the trick. I have another question here um, from the comments. Do you think a plugger tool that removes a plug will work as well as that plug auger? They might. I've never tried them. Um, it probably depends on your soil. You know, I, I imagine they probably would if, you know, if your soil isn't too hard. Um, even those augers can be can be tough and compacted or clay soil. Um, they can they can send you in a circle instead of removing the soil. <clears throat> All right, and I think my last question here is an extremely self-serving question. So get ready, I'm gonna throw you a softball. Um, I'm really excited about this. I love all the native plants, uh, but I'm not sure what to pick. Where do I start? Well, getting a garden kit is a great um, option. Uh, so um, we uh, produce and offer through the the conservation district plant sales here a uh, plant by number garden kit and um, they're available for order um, for Grand Traverse on on the district's website and um, so there's I think seven different kits um, there uh, so it's a 38 cell plug flat of those those plugs that we saw photos of earlier that are um, a variety, uh, usually something around like 12, 13 or more species, um, that, and they have a theme. So uh, monarch or shoreline or shade, um, and uh, they're uh, basically a garden in a tray. And um, you can, they come with a little planting plan, and it's a good way to um, just get a good variety of, of plants in the ground uh, with a little bit of you know guidance and uh, from the kit and you have an instant garden. So that's a good option. Um, and uh, you know beyond that, uh, some of the book resources I mentioned earlier have some some good uh, sort of lists and ideas um, there. And um, you know feel free to chat with any of us if you're if you're at the plant sale to be happy to give you some pointers. Perfect, thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, and a point, a point I wanna make that's related to that too is, um, you know, wanna help remove as many barriers as possible for people to, to getting native plants in the ground. I mean, it can seem really daunting, uh, the idea of, of um, you know, trying to prep the site and get the mulch and get the plants and uh, it has to be perfect and, um, you know, it, really starting with anything is a great um, a great way to go. Even if you're just putting some of these plants do really well in a planter uh, box, you know, um, just a small raised bed, um, you know, somewhere in your yard, uh, or even um, just uh, you know, in with some uh, God forbid non-native plants um, that you might not be able to get rid of yet, but it's a, a long-term goal. Uh, but getting these native plants out there. Um, you know, is going to give you a little more experience in working with them and it's going to help provide that, that benefit. So go for it. Absolutely. I think they're, I think they're really great. It's just for a nice little four by 10 area. So it's not, it's not anything insane. You know, you don't have to go crazy and um, they're, they're really fun. We, we get lots of great feedback from folks every year about, oh my gosh, like some of them even bloomed in the first year. So it's really nice. Well, and with that, I think we're gonna let everybody go a couple minutes early. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Garrett, um, yes, for all of you. your knowledge and wisdom. And uh, thanks to Shelly for joining us as well. Uh, it, was, it was great to have you, so.
Thanks, everyone, and have a great right. night. Thank you.